All right, so other reasons to use Julia besides some of this cool performance stuff. Uh, so it's free and it's open source uh, in contrast to MATLAB. Um, so it was actually kind of originally made um, as a reason to not use MATLAB. I think Alan Edelman is the, the main guy at MIT who was kind of started Julia with one of his students. Uh, he really just wanted something that was better at linear algebra than MATLAB was. Uh, and it's kind of evolved into something a lot bigger than that. So most of Julia is written in Julia, so it's easier to find out what's going on. Um, so a lot of R and Python packages are written in C and Fortran and other things. Uh, whereas with Julia, if you don't know what's going on, you just have to read their Julia code, which is a lot easier to read. Uh, there's also this really cool macro called edit. Uh, and, all right. I don't know. So let's look at, I don't know, the sum function. So I use this macro and all right, and it's showing me the exact Julia function that's being called there. Um, it just opens it up in your text editor. So this is, so it's just using a call to MapReduce. Hopefully you can read that a little bit. Um, yeah, so it's mapping the sum function over A, and then it's using the identity uh, function to reduce it to itself. So edit is pretty cool. If you don't know what's going on, you can just read the Julia code right there. Yeah, so, so this is, so it, Julia is going to call the most specific method available. So notice there's a whole bunch of definitions here. So if I call an array of Boolean values of true, false, it's going to just count the non-zeros. Um, if I, I'm not sure what callable is, that must be some abstract type that I don't know. But basically, so this is the, looks like the, the, the fallback definition. Um, and so MapReduce is probably optimize over which arguments A you're giving it. So you give it two functions uh, and then a type here. Um, yeah, so it's actually doing a, a MapReduce call, but since it's calling identity, it's basically just calling sum on A, or the plus function on A. Yeah, so all operators like plus and minus and, and div division um, are all just operated, normal operators in Julia. This is not. There's, so there's some uh, like experimental multi-threading stuff going on in Julia, but that is not quite in there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So writing in Julia gives you expertise in Julia development. Uh, in contrast to R, if you want to be a very good R package developer, you need to depend on C++ and Fortran. Um, and so that the authors of Julia talk about this as the two-language problem. Uh, and this is the idea that prototype code needs to go into a high-level language like Python or R, and then production code needs to go into a low-level language like C++ or Fortran. So I think quite obviously there, there are going to be major wins for a language that lends itself to both of these things. Um, it's very easy to go from slow prototype code in Julia to fast production code in Julia. Um, and just when you're writing algorithms in general, that's just kind of the way you r naturally write, is that you write the slow version that works, and then you optimize later. Uh, and I think Julia is just great for that. So R is great, but it was never intended to be high performance. So when you look at Hadley Wickham's advanced R book uh, online, so the very first line of the performance section is R is not a fast language. Uh, this is not an accident, and the second heading is why is R slow? So if you're looking to do high performance computing, um, it looks like R is not the place for you, and that's kind of by design. Uh, or at least they'll, they'll claim it's by design at least. Uh, there's also some major deficiencies in the core language. Uh, so some of these things are fixed with packages. Uh, things like DevTools, roxygen 2 um, those help with uh, package development a lot. Uh, the matrix package gives sparse regression or sparse matrix support. Uh, that's something that's built into Julia. Um, so it's missing some of these things, which you can fix with packages. Um, other things are harder to fix. So R uses a, an old version of BLOSS. Uh, and I think that is because this older version from like the 80s uh, supports missing values, uh, which the current version of BLOSS supports NANs, not a number. Uh, and both NANs and null values kind of poison the values that they uh, multiply with. But there's slightly different rules between null values and NANs. Uh, and for whatever reason, the R people really want the, the rules that work with null values. Um, but anyway, so there's a whole bunch of optimizations that have obviously been made in the last 30 years um, that you don't get with R versions of BLAST. So you can, you can build R with newer versions, um, but it's just like an extra thing that you have to do. So Revolution R, which is Microsoft's R product, is basically just R built with a faster BLAST library. 
And then some things are impossible to fix, just clunky syntax and poor design choices, um, which there are many examples of that I won't go into. Um, so there's only six active developers left um, out of the 20 R core members. So these are the people that have commit access to the repository that, that has base R. Um, so Julia has a very small core team, but has many contributors. Uh, in fall 2015, the last time I gave this talk, there were 479 contributors. Uh, now it's 530. Um, you can take a look at the graphs, and it shows how, how people have committed over time. Uh, Doug Bates, he wrote the matrix, so the sparse matrix support for R and LME4, Lexmin linear effects models uh, for R, and he's a member of R Core. Uh, had this quote that I really like. Uh, As some of you know, I have had a rather late midlife crisis and run off with another language called Julia. Um, so he, he kind of switched away from the R world and is now or adding a whole bunch of cool stuff to Julia. Uh, so he's added a lot uh, to GLM and data frames and mixed models. Uh, seems to be a package that he's focusing on the most. Uh, another one is called Feather, which is a, a data frame backend that's language agnostic. So it's you can use transfer data frames from R into Julia and Python uh, really easily. Yeah, if you haven't heard of Feather, it's pretty cool. So Wes McKinney, who wrote Pandas, uh, got together with Hadley Wickham to write uh, basically a, a um, in-disk uh, data frame format that you could transfer between languages, uh, and Feather is what they came up with. So it's pretty neat. All right, so what is the state of Julia? So this is the number of tagged packages uh, in Julia over time. So let's see, so we're in, I don't know, somewhere around here, we're at about, I don't know, 1,100 or so. We can take a look at about a year ago, and we had about, I don't know, 700 or so. So not quite doubling uh, in the last year, but still pretty strong growth. And uh, version 0 0.5 was just released a couple weeks ago, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so if you start with Julia, definitely download 0 0.5 and not an older version. Um, and here are just this number of stars. So on pretty much every package is hosted on GitHub, and this is just the total uh, number of stars for, for Julia packages. And so we're almost at 20,000 now, uh, and about a year ago. So we're at about 10,000 or so. So I see this is a good thing, that the, the number of stars has doubled, or it's, th that is growing at a faster rate than the number of tag packages. Because um, I see number of tag packages as a very rough estimate of the number of contributors to Julia, and the number of stars are a very rough estimate of the number of users of Julia. Um, so it's just good to see that the number of users are going up faster relatively to the number of people that are actually writing their own packages. So are people taking Julia seriously? Uh, so the New York Fed um, had a very large MATLAB code uh, for this dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, uh, which is now in Julia, now all open source. Um, Open Mendel um, is, was originally, I think, like 60 or 70,000 lines of Fortran, uh, which is now in the process of going into Julia. So this is actually one of my advisor's projects. Um, but it does a whole bunch of statistical analysis tools uh, for genetics. Um, Intel has uh, Intel Labs, and they're working on this HPAT, which is a competitor to Spark, uh, this big distributed computing um, framework. And then there's also this arbitrary ranking system, which recently put Julia in the top 50. So I don't know if you've heard of the Tyobi index. I think it's silly to rank languages, but Julia's now 47, so, so good for us. Um, I don't know, I guess it's good to, to see some recognition. Uh, but anyways. 